My name is Greg Wenis, and I am from Spring Grove since childhood, and that is um, the reason I have the first bond with Mr. Joel Langland. I'm very honored and uh, grateful to get to be here and share some memories of who I first heard in the Little White Highland Church to be somewhat of a legend uh, celebrity in this area and around the world because of his poetry, Joe Langland, who was a member of the church, the same church that I grew up in, the Little Highland Lutheran Church. So I heard stories about Joe from my family and members of the church and uh, saw him at the church uh, at one time or maybe a couple of times as a child. The next contact I had with Joe was in Spring Grove, Minnesota, when I was working with the sculptor Craig Bergsgaard and with Karen Gray and others in the community to place the Quest sculpture on the western corner of the park in Spring Grove. And Joe was commissioned to write a poem in honor of that dedication event, which I emceed. And so it was there that we had some chats and that evening at Karen Gray and Jim Gray's beautiful home for a lovely dinner. My wife Jacqueline and I sat across from Joe and hit it off almost immediately because of our common bond of growing up in a rich agricultural, spiritual, kind, fertile, loving <laughs> area. Not long after meeting Joe and having that experience, I was attending some uh, meetings in Decorah, Iowa, and after the meetings that I would attend on Monday night, I'd stop at the local sandwich shop and ran into Joe there. And Joe invited me to sit down, and I and a friend sat with him. And much like the book, Tuesdays with Maury, it became Mondays with Joe. And then another sculpture followed in the Viking Park and another poem and another ceremony and another supper. And all these many meetings over several years in the mid 2000s from probably about 2004 to 2007. Joe was born in February of 1917 and passed away in uh, April of 2007. So during the latter years of his life, when he had moved from Massachusetts to Decorah to retire and lived at the Benyon home on the north edge of Decorah, were the times that we spent together at that little restaurant. And then, of course, out of those meetings and, and visits, uh, visits to our home and his home, and we got to be very, very good friends. In reflecting about Joe Langland, many deep emotions come. Joe was a very rare, unique individual in that, as we've all heard, we're spiritual beings on a human journey. Joe was an extremely spiritual person on a human journey. Joe seemed to me to be able to take in, especially from nature, and of course all the people that he loved, but especially from nature, and the nature and the surrounding geography of southeastern Minnesota and northeastern Iowa, all of the little subtleties and colors and dimensions and reasons and aspects and intricate details about the surroundings uh, where he placed himself and intentionally or accidentally placed himself and would draw in or inhale in the spiritualities and the feelings and the love of nature into himself somehow. 
and somehow turned it all around in there in a loving and kind and soft-spoken, easy way, and then could exhale it out of himself in the form of poetry or conversation, mainly poetry, and education and teaching and, and uh, the sharing of all of his discoveries in a, such an incredibly articulate and warm, powerfully delivered manner. I have never, I don't believe, met anyone quite like my good friend Joe Langland. Possibly the rich richness of this region and the warmth of the people and the fact that many of our ancestors, not just Scandinavian or Norwegian in particular, but all nationalities that immigrated from Europe and everywhere else in the middle 1800s had to give up so much is woven, I believe, into a lot of the things that he has written about, especially the poem Norwegian Rivers. Yeah, they are so kind of restless. I wrote a little poem for the front of the quest statue that says something like, in eternal honor of our ancestors who left so much to start here with so little in order that we might have everything. It was the one poem that I wrote that Joe really liked. I shared several others with him over the years, and sometimes he would sit in his home there in at Denium and listen to my poetry and look at the ceiling after he heard it, carefully listen and say, astonishing, <laughs> astonishing. I don't know if it was that it was so astonishingly poor or medium or actually good, but he made me feel like it was good, like he did with everyone. And then he would say, and all that, after only one draft, <laughs> which, you know, you could say, well, yeah, I guess I do need to work on it some more. Joe told me stories about, as a child, walking through tall green grass or hay fields or forests or wooded areas south of Spring Grove on the, on the home place, the Langland Farm, just near the Minnesota-Iowa border, and walking down into the confluence, don't you love that word, confluence of the North and South Bears and letting the water rush around him. And that word confluence describes to me, in my way of thinking or feeling, a lot of what Joe Langland was about. The confluence of so many especially beautiful elements and sort of gently turning away the darker or more unpleasant ones to seek and discover the richly beautiful or more powerful ones or more adventurous ones. Joe would laugh at himself, chuckle, shake his head. Oh my goodness, I can't believe I did that. As I look back, I wonder what was I thinking when he did some of these adventures when he was in Wyoming at the University of Wyoming, he shared about how he and a student from one of his classes were aware that the big river out there, whichever one it was, was raging and swollen in, in uh, flood. And so he and this student came up with the idea if they just tied some logs together, they could raft down the swollen river and have a great adventure. So they tied a bunch of old timbers together, haphazardly constructed, probably dangerous, as Joe would share now, and jumped on and away they went with nothing more than a pole to try to control. And of course they discovered instantly when they left the shore that this was not the wisest thing that they could have possibly done. <laughs> Now, they're floating down the raging, swollen, flooded river, and they're trying to find a way to get off this raft and survive. And they hollered out to people as they went by, and of course no one could hear them, and 
eventually the raft went close enough to a shoreline, a steep wooded shoreline, and there were long branches coming out over the river. <laughs> so they said, we have to try to catch this big limb. And as the raft went under the branch, the big limb, they both took a giant leap, caught it, and hung on to the limb <laughs> until some people came and rescued them off of it. <laughs> but here's this quiet, soft-spoken man, not to exert a pun, but churning like the flooded rivers with curiosity about all that God had made, wherever it was. One time, he told a story about going to Lapland, northern Norway, way up above probably the Arctic Circle, I don't know. Certainly an extremely cold, desolate area to say some poems at some event. After which he was invited to go and spend some days in an igloo, of all things, or some shelter in far north, uh, snowy, dark, dangerous territory, and the man had to leave and told him that at some point in time, someone will come to pick you up and no one came. And I don't know how long it was. It was one day, two days, three days, but it certainly caused Joe great concern. And finally, somebody showed up on a snowmobile and pulled Joe out of this desolate place to go across dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of miles to safely. And again, I don't know what I was thinking about to accept that invitation. <laughs> Uh, so, another story back in Wyoming that I is probably one of my favorites. He went out to what he called a dude ranch. And while he was there, he met a man named Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller, certainly an internationally known figure in his own right. But as some may recall, was married at the time to none other than Marilyn Monroe. Arthur Miller had written a play called, or was producing a film from a play called The Misfits, which not only starred Marilyn Monroe, but also the famous Clark Gable. And as Joe did with so many, struck up friendships with people who instantly uh, found Joe to be warm and, and easy to approach and and, and enjoyable to be around, as Arthur Miller did. And in their friendship that was established there on that ranch where they were filming The Misfits, Mr. Miller politely asked Joe Langland if he could use his name as the name of the title character, which was played by Clark Gable. So in the movie Misfits, if you watch Clark Gable's character and see that his name is Langland, the name actually was from our friend, Joe Langland. In retirement, Joe reflected on his beautiful wife, Judith, and his children who he loved beyond description. And in his apartment at Benyam, he had yellow sticky notes, maybe hundreds of yellow sticky notes all over the kitchen counters. It was clear that he obviously didn't cook there. <laughs> they had a great place to eat at Benyam, so he didn't need to perhaps, but that was the first symptom or first sign that Joe's mind was not as reliable as he would have liked it to have been in his later years. And slowly, very slowly, as his mind released the ability to recall and remember as quickly as he would have liked to, it was clear that his memory was changing. We went to lunch at Hearts Tea and Tarts in Decorah several times, and I would bring friends and uh, guests of mine to meet Joe, and we would have wonderful conversations. And Peggy Hart, the proprietor of Hearts Tea and Tarts, came to our table one day, and she said, Joe, I want to tell you that last night, my husband, who was in the military and was serving uh, on the East Coast someplace and wasn't home often, but when he did come home, 
shared in a romantic way his care for his wife to the point that one night Peggy said she wakened in the middle of the night in the dark and her husband was reciting one of Joe's poems, whispering it, a love poem, into her ear in the middle of the night. And she was so excited and happy to be able to tell the author, Joe Langland, that only recently her husband had awakened her in the middle of the night, reciting one of his love poems. And, his, and of course, Joe's reaction is, oh my goodness, I can't understand why anybody would do that. His humility was incredible, incredibly humble. To the point that one of his conversations with me was when the committee to establish the Rosa Parks Memorial contacted him. And as you know, Rosa Parks was the black lady in the South during the civil rights days active days, who refused to sit in the back of the bus. The committee had stated that Rosa Parks' favorite poet of all of the famous American poets was Joe Langland, above Robert Frost, who was, according to Joe, one of his good friends, and Maya Angelou and all of the other great poets. And they said on the wall of her famous poets or favorite poets at her memorial, they wanted Joe Langland's name to be the largest and at the very top, above all of the other great poets. And of course, Joe, in his typical way, said, oh my, no, of goodness, goodness gracious, of course I can't have that. What, what, what are they thinking? They, I can't be above all of these other great and wonderful poets. And I loved that about Joe. I loved his humility. I feel chills as I sit here and think about Joe. I'm sure his spirit is with us here right now, smiling in his loving and gentle and kind way as he described, you know, the sacrifice of people and animals in the sacrifice poems, the heart-wrenching, uh, terrible, awful challenge of having to dispose of a gunny sack of cats in the water tank because it was the humane thing to do at the time. And his, his poems, like so many favorites, Song at Evening or War, In the, in the poem War, there's a sentence in here, and there's, for all of us, so many favorite sentences and so many favorite poems. But as an example, in the poem War, where he describes the horrible tragedy of losing his brother on the Luzon in World War II, his brother Harold, one verse says, in the rocking, rolling hills, West of the Mississippi, his father and mother sat in a simple Norwegian parlor. Get this line. With a photograph smiling between them on the table and their hands fallen into their laps like sticks and dust. To be able to describe human emotion, the human experience, in such wonderful and eloquent and relatable terms is just such a treasure. I feel so fortunate to have run into Joe and become friends with this especially warm and beautiful human being. The last conversation that we had was not long before he passed away on his birthday, which is in February, not long after my birthday in the same month. And I recall calling him from Arizona. And he didn't know who I was. And he asked me to please give him some information about myself. And I would give him information about Spring Grove which he would hear, yes, Spring Grove, Highland Church, yes, 
Highland Church, Wenis family, oh yes, Greg, and he would apologize in such a way as to make the other person feel comfortable, which was always his motive, saying, from what you tell me about yourself, we must have had a wonderful friendship, honest. I asked him one time, Joe, in all the poems in all the world, what is the one basic ingredient? And he shared with me, well, of course, it has to be honest. Even in his last conversation with him, he was honest in saying he didn't know who I was. But he was also honest in saying, from what I had said, we must have been very good friends. Joe Langland was not above God. He was not above anyone, nor below anyone, but an insatiable, innocent, interesting curiosity for all that the Creator had made in and around people and especially in and around nature. His description of sunsets and flowers and hay-filled fields. So, Joe Langland was a treasure, is a treasure, for me and I know for many, many others, of course his family will always be a treasure. And I know that heaven is a much better place because Joe Langland is there and it's one of the many, many reasons I look forward to going there, hopefully a long time from now. I'll look forward to seeing Joe again.